show her how you put it on. Okay. <laughs>
صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين سورة الفاتحة In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful All the praises and thanks be to Allah, the Lord of mankind, jinn, and all that exists the most gracious, the most merciful, the only owner and the only ruling judge of the day of resurrection. You alone we worship and you alone we ask for help. Guide us to the straight way. The way of those on whom you have bestowed your grace, not of those who have earned your anger and not of those who have went astray. <clears throat> this next passage is from Surah Mario. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فأنت به قومها تحمله قالوا يا مريم لقد جئت شيئا فريا يا أخت هارون ما كان أبوك امرأ سوء وما كانت أمك بويا فأشارت إليه قالوا كيف نكلم من كان في المهد صبيا قال إني عبد الله آتاني الكتاب وجعلني نبيا وجعلني مباركا أينما كنت وأوصاني بالصلاة والزكاة ما دمت حيا وبرا بوالدتي ولم يجعلني جبارا شقيا والسلام علي يوم ولدت ويوم أموت ويوم أبعث حيا ذلك عيسى بن مريم قول الحق الذي فيه يمترون ما كان لله أن يتخذ من ولد سبحانه إذا قضى أمرا فإنما يقول له كن فيكون. <coughs> This is the translation. Then she brought the baby to her people, carrying him. They said, O oh Mary, indeed you have brought an unheard mighty thing. O oh sister of Aaron, your father, who was not a man who used to commit adultery, nor your mother, who was an unchaste woman. Then she pointed to him. They said, How can, how can we talk to one who is a child in the cradle? Jesus said, Verily, I am a slave of Allah. He has given me the scripture and made me a prophet. And he has made me blessed wheresoever I be, and has enjoyed me in salat and zakat as long as I live. And beautiful to my mother, and made me not arrogant or unblessed. And peace be upon me the day I was born, and the day I die, and the day I shall be raised alive. Such is Jesus, son of Mary. It is a statement of truth about which they dispute. God is too exalted to have a son. When he decided to bring something into existence, he needs only to command it to exist, and it comes into existence. Thank you. Thank you, Hamza Safwan. That was very beautiful. So next, I have And I'd like to go ahead and invite one of our board of directors, as well as the current secretary of this particular organization, Dr. Muhammad Abdul Lafour. He will come up and provide everyone in history of this particular organization. I was just reminded that we were incorporated August 26th of 1982, which makes us 37 years old, and we're on our 38th birthday about a week or so, less than a week. Or so old. Uh, but Dr. Muhammad, Dr. Muhammad earned a PhD degree from the University of Mississippi in electrical engineering in 2000, and he has been working for Motorola Mobility for the past 22 years, and currently serves as the executive director of engineering. So I asked Dr. Muhammad to come on up and provide an update as well as a history of our organization. Thank you, Brother Tabis, for this kind introduction. Again, uh, on behalf of the Board of Directors, I welcome you all. 
joining us in this uh, beautiful uh, afternoon and choosing to spend with us, that means a lot to us. That really shows your commitment to get to know your neighbors, so we greatly appreciate it. Welcome again. As uh, Brother Tabrish said, we are not new here, not many people know. We are in existence in this uh, neighborhood. In fact, uh, when back in 1982, we were in a building which is just two buildings east of uh, this building. And we have been here almost for the 38th year now, as he said. And it started as a small community organization and uh, uh, for uh, the Muslims of that time who were in this neighborhood to get together and pray. And the vision of this statement as our founders or whoever started out here, uh, it, they established this vision statement to build an exemplary and powerful community of Muslims around the masjid who like earlier generations support each other in the matters of this world and the hereafter and enjoy the true spirit of Islam. That's the vision of this uh, organization. The mission statement is to provide a community environment for the families to come together with a shared interest to pray, learn, more importantly help and serve where our youth can cultivate consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is really a word for God. In fact, the Arabic Bible, the Bible in Arabic I was told uses the same word Allah for the God and develop good habits and become law-abiding citizens and contributing members of the society. So that is the mission that we strive on a day-to-day -day basis. The programs and services are very similar to what a typical church would do. So we have, as part of our faith, we have five pillars. One of them is daily five prayers. So we have that going on here. And then we have weekly services going on on Fridays, which is kind of equivalent to the Sunday services that you typically have in your churches, which happens around uh, noonish to 2 p.m. on Fridays. And the month of Ramadan, the fasting, which is another pillar of uh, our religion, that uh, where is a huge, where at that time, all the community members joined together for breaking the fast together or starting the fast together and having special prayers uh, throughout the night. And then we also have for children uh, learning uh, Quran and memorization that uh, you just heard from the memorization program goes on in the evening as well. These are some of the religious aspects of the programs. And then on the right side, what we have listed, several of uh, other social activities that we do. Some of them, one of the other pillars of religion is really charity, which uh, our Imam will go through in a lot more detail shortly. The poor and needy from all around the Chicago land come here. Usually on Sundays, we have a larger gathering. A lot of them come around. They take a train. They come to the Arlington Park Station. Some of our volunteers will go and pick them up and we, we, we check their background and if they are really needy then we try to serve them because we collect the, the charity which is a part of our faith, people contribute to the uh, masjid dedicated to that particular cause. They give for, donate for the running the organization but then certain portion of it is given for uh, charity. So that is uh, taken care. And then we also have a scholarship program for our uh, 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 needy family youth who need to go to college and stuff like that. We take care of that. And there are several other programs we do. One other thing I want to highlight is we are very actively engaged in the civic activities of the, of the city and the neighborhood. In particular, in the city of Rolling Meadows, you, if some of you are familiar with the Rolling Meadows July 4th Parade, we are usually a participant in that. And then we are partnering with a lot of the church and religious organizations around this neighborhood, Arlington Heights, Rolling Meadows, Palatine neighborhood and we do a lot of shared programs. We have exchange programs every other weekend or so. We go to the, some of the churches and they come here. So we have those type of programs going on. So we have a dedicated group who drive that effort. And uh, that is one of the key programs. So th these are very similar to what a typical church would do. So we are very proud to be uh, engaged and partnering with every one of you. The, this location, Typically, I am told in the Chicagoland area, there may be around anywhere from 50 to 100, I don't know the exact number, uh, masjids or the mosques are available. But in the northwest suburb, this is located in a neighborhood. I have a map of it on the right, where there is not any other mosque uh, for about 10 to 12 miles around our area. So the circle that you see, the, we serve a dozen cities in the neighborhood. Not only the residents of the cities, but there are Schomburg, there are Rolling there are people who come to 
work here, so we serve them, uh, uh, provide a place for them uh, to uh, do their religious service as well. And um, now going on to the, we, as you know, since we started in 1982, and the community has grown, and we have embarked on a project to move into a bigger building, because we need a bigger facility, and you are sitting in the main prayer hall, Normally we won't have chairs because we don't have a separate room to host you with the chairs and stuff. So we are kind of reusing our main prayer area by putting the chairs. So we are trying to build up a better facility so that the youth can have a gymnasium or we can host a bigger uh, uh, audience like yours and while having independent programs. And uh, you, on the back side of the room when you entered is where we have our uh, Sunday school classes. They are rather small, so we are trying to build a bigger facility. So we have a facility we have bought back in 2015, uh, right uh, just when you, if you drove through this side, you may have seen that building. So thanks to many of you, uh, and also the members of the City of Rolling Meadows that helped us get the zoning approval, because we happen to be located in uh, industrial zone, if you notice that. So that provided a little bit of challenge, to put it mildly, and we had a little bit challenge, and we worked with the uh, city of Rolling Meadows and uh, people of faith like you uh, and the uh, common citizens of the neighborhood really helped us in supporting and to get our zoning approved. So if you are here or if you are not here or if your families or friends have helped us, we are so grateful to all the support that we have received from every uh, one of the community members in having a diverse community uh, in this uh, neighborhood. Thank you so much for that. And uh, we have, <laughs> we currently, I just wanted to give an update on the program. So we have, uh, we, we got the building and then we got the zoning approval last summer, actually around this week, I think, exactly one year. And we are currently working on finalizing the architecture plans and uh, we are getting ready to go into getting the city uh, approval for the uh, permit for the engineering drawings, which we expect to have uh, sometime early 2020, and then go through the uh, building in the next two to three years. We are hoping we would move into the uh, new building, inshallah, meaning our building, and with the support of the community, somewhere around 22 to 23 time frame. And we uh, look forward to having this continued cooperation and support uh, from uh, all this diverse uh, community of faith around this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for that update. So next we have our current resident scholar of this organization, Imam Nazir Shaheen sitting up on the stage. Some background information on him. Imam Shaheen graduated from NIU, Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, in 1996, completing his bachelor's in industrial engineering. Thereafter, he served as the head of the Islamic Studies, as well as the director of the Youth Center at Mosque Foundation in Bridgeview, as well as Universal High School in Bridgeview. After that, he traveled overseas to Damascus to further his Islamic studies and studied Sharia comparative religion in Damascus for the next three years from 2001 to 2003. Thereafter, he came back to the States and served as the Imam and Director of the Orland Park Prayer Center team. Since 2014, we've been blessed to have him as our resident scholar, and he's currently pursuing his master's degree at the American Islamic College in downtown Chicago. He lives in Palos Hills with his wife and children. So I invite Imam Shaheen, he's already on the stage, to speak with you on the fundamentals of Islam as well as the principles of Islam and the meaning of prayer. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And God bless you all. As we greet you in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. God's peace and blessings be upon all of you. And uh, it's such a beautiful gathering. There is nothing better than being with the extended families. And that's how we view our neighbors and friends. You are not just neighbors and friends, but you are our extended family in, in, in this town. Uh, I'm often asked about 
some introduction about Islam. And uh, people look at the religion of Islam and they try to put it in a few words. I find the best definition as a way of life. It's a way of life because it does affect literally every aspect in our life. Actually, if you look at the Quran, the holy book revealed by Angel Jibreel from God, the Almighty, to the last prophet, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it never addressed faith as just mere ideology. But always, faith is brought in the context of doing good deeds. So you find it always in Arabic, says, Amanu wa amilu salihat. Those who believe and do good deeds. Every time God spoke about the righteous, the good doers, the successful ones, the ones who are going to pass and go to heaven, they are the people who believe and do good deeds. So action is the interpretation of faith. There is nothing in Islam where somebody says, I believe in so and so, but then he or she acts in contrary to that. So this way of life is built on five pillars. It's not the five pillars. Islam is not the five pillars. But there is five pillars for this skyscraping, uh, 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 high-rise building. The five pillars are the testimony of faith. The thing that make a person a Muslim is to utter a statement that he or she believes in it, that there is absolutely no God except one, the creator of heaven and earth, our sustainer, the most merciful the most beneficent, the all-knowing, the all-hearing, the most powerful, the all-loving, one God, and that Muhammad is the last messenger. So we believe God sent over 120,000 prophets and messengers throughout the human history, but the very last one was Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, in Arabia, we believe God sent so many messages and books. We believe in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And we believe that the Quran is the very last testament. So again, going back to the pillars of Islam, the testimony of faith. Number two is that we believe in angels, that we are not just the only creatures God created but angels are another type of creatures. We believe in all the prophets, number three, in all the books, number four, and we believe that there is a day of judgment, a day where we be resurrected and brought to accountability, day of judgment, where people will be judged by the most just, by the just, by the almighty God who will put for us our books and only our records. Our deeds will be uh, uh, testifying for us or against us. The last uh, 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 again, the pillars and uh, obviously here I'm uh, too excited. I started with the articles of the testimony or the, the belief in one God, believe in all the books, and believe in the, uh, all the prophets, believe in the day of judgment, and believe in, in the destiny or predestiny. That not everything we have a say in it. I and you, we did not choose our race, our skin color, where and when to come to this world. And there's a lot of other things that we had no choice. Those are not matters of, of, or subjects to prefer uh, some over another. And we have to deal with those as best chose for us by God. Best chose 
for us by God. But we are accountable for what we do, for the choices we make. You made a choice to come here today to get to know more about your Muslim neighbors and about the mosque in your neighborhood. You made a choice, an effort, and you are to be rewarded for this choice you made on the Day of Judgment. So those are articles of faith, but I want to go back to the pillars of Islam and remember what we started with. Way of life as a definition. Again, the first pillar of, of Islam is the testimony of faith. But the second will be prayer, the five daily prayer, which I plan, God willing, to perform a segment of prayer in front of you to share that with you because often people look at Muslim prayer and wonder because it's always performed in Arabic, the language of Quran. And we, uh, we always find people wondering what does that mean and what does it represent, etc. Mm -hmm. So I chose to, to take about whatever, five, ten minutes from my time to perform uh, a segment of the prayer and explain it in, in English. So prayer, which is called Salah, which means connection with God. So five daily, five times a day, we leave our wall, bed in the morning, and get up and stand in front of God. And we pray one on one. We pray to God asking God for all that which we need. Number three will be zakah, or almsgiving. The charity that God told us there is a right in the wealth of the rich for the less fortunate. It's not just an act of goodness. It's their right. Yes, we might work hard for the money, we acquire the wealth, but whomever is above the poverty line and has access of wealth, they are obliged to share some of that with the less fortunate in the community. And that's done on annual basis. 2.5% of the uh, uh, wealth beyond, again, uh, what we call the poverty line where you are debt-free and you are uh, in, in, in a well-off position to be able to help. And the Muslim usually look at his inner circle first, his family, his cousins, his relatives, and, or her family and cousins and relatives, and try to give them and take care of them before looking for them. When everyone around you or related to you uh, is doing fine, you look farther in your neighborhood, in your city, and so forth, before you go beyond your city and help others. We believe if everyone look at his or her uh, immediate uh, neighbors, then we would be all in better shape. Number four would be fasting, the month of Ramadan. Once a, month, once a year, we have a month where we fast, abstain from food and drinks, from dawn, which is about an hour before sunrise, till sunset, all day long hours. And we believe that strengthens our wills, remind us about who we are and refocus, so we are not constantly indulged in, in, the, uh, uh, in what we desire, but we reflect on the values of life. And we feel for those who are less fortunate and who might not always have food and drinks available for them. The last of the five pillars will be Hajj, or the pilgrimage to Mecca. Once in a lifetime, a Muslim, every Muslim man or woman, if they are in a position where they can afford it physically and financially. 
they are about to perform the Hajj. A trip to Mecca, the first house of worship, we believe by the first human being, Adam and Eve, who came down to earth from home, <coughs> paradise, came down to earth, and they allocated this area to come daily and pray to God. That same area, we believe, was visited by most prophets and messengers throughout history. And the walls of that building were erected by whom we call the father of the prophets, Abraham and his son Ishmael, who made it look like the cube we believe exists today. And we simply go there to walk the walk and to reflect and to remember that we are not a new religion. Islam means submission to God, is the religion of the very first human being and all the prophets of God, including Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, peace be upon them all. So before I start the performance of, of prayer in front of you, I want to just put a few words reflecting on worship. Worship in Islam is defined as an obedient act. So worship is not something you are forced to do, but it's something you choose to do. And this choice is mixed with love. So we worship with love. We don't worship just because we are servants and creatures and we are in need. We know who we are and our needs and how great the Almighty and how mighty He is. But we worship because we want to worship. And we worship because we love whom we worship. And this love and this act of worship or obedience is based on knowledge. So it got to be based on knowledge. It's not an act where I just simply imitate mom or dad or a friend or a teacher. But it's an act that I am fully convinced and intellectually believe that this is the right thing and that's what I need to do. And this act of voluntarily obedience that is mixed with love and founded on knowledge, we believe that this act of worship leads to eternal happiness. Happiness in this life and happiness in the hereafter. So, if you look at any Sharia or Islamic law, you find Islam consists of Aqidah, faith, and Muamalat, dealings with others, and Ibadat, worship. So you worship, and the worship is connection to God and doing good to the creatures of God. It's not only your relationship with God. You worship God by cleaning your neighborhood, by taking care of your kids, by looking after your elders, by checking on your neighbor, by being a good citizen. You worship God by doing good to everything that God created, from the environment that you are careful not to own, to the animals that are God's creatures and you deal with them with dignity and respect, to the human beings whom you respect mutually and love, for they are God's creatures. So, again, worship is obedient to God and doing good to the creatures of God. Before I perform a segment of the prayer, I want to emphasize that prayer for us, just like everything in Islam, 
is not something new. We believe even our prayer, we look at the uh, Old Testament and the New Testament and we see prophets falling down on the ground with their forehead on the ground and performing prayer to God. And I bring here Matthew 26, 39, where we are told about Jesus, peace be upon him. He fell with his face to the ground and prayed. And I'm going to perform part of the prayer as we do it in Arabic, but all out loud. And then I'm going to go through it with English translation. Here, so it's easier just to uh, watch in general. And we are, are, when we face in prayer, we face Mecca. As I say, the first house of worship, we face Mecca, where we believe is the oldest house of worship. And that it's as a focal point where all Muslims throughout the world pray facing Mecca. But we are not praying to Mecca. We are praying to God. And that is only a focal point. And God said in the Quran, it doesn't matter which way you turn, east or west turn your face to the Almighty God. So if you are not sure which direction Mecca will be, then it doesn't matter, you still pray. So in our case here in North America, Mecca will be northeast of us, if you look at the globe, not a flat map. Okay, the shortest distance goes from Chicago to Mecca. If you put a string, it will go through northeast. So for us, we are facing northeast. And I'm going to perform again a segment. This part of the prayer is repeated two or three or four times, depend on which prayer, the morning, the noon, the afternoon, or the evening. So I'm going to, again, go through it in Arabic first, and then I'm going to start to explain every part of it. Allahu Akbar. الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد الله أكبر سبحان ربي العظيم سبحان ربي العظيم سبحان ربي العظيم سمع الله لمن حمد ربنا لك الحمد الله أكبر سبحان ربي العظيم سبحان ربي العظيم سبحان ربي الله أكبر الله أكبر سبحان ربي العلا سبحان ربي العلا سبحان ربي العلا الله أكبر What I just performed is a segment that again can be repeated two, three, or four times depending on which prayer. As you saw when we say Allah Akbar, God is great and we raise our hands. This is the time where you're simply gonna try to concentrate on your prayer, your connection with God. So physically, as if I'm throwing everything behind my back. It doesn't matter, we come to prayer, maybe we are worried about a test coming up, or a health check we need to perform, 
or assignment or whatever we have, we are always constantly occupied mentally with things we are doing. But now it's time for prayer and we remind ourselves that God is greater. Don't worry, every problem has a, a solution. God is greater than your worries, than your problem, than your issue. Leave it. Now concentrate on your relationship with God. God is greater. And then we recite the opening chapter of Quran in which we start by praising God. All praise be to God. The Lord of the universe. Every universe. The Lord of humans. The uh, the world of uh, the, the world of animal, the animal kingdom, the plants, the, the everything in this universe is the creatures or the creation of God, and He is the Lord of all of that, and He is the most merciful, most beneficent. It's you, God, we worship, and from you we seek help. So please guide us to the straight path. The path of those who are blessed, not those who gone astray, or the uh, uh, or, or, or those the cursed one. So we see it's a relationship. It's where we praise God and ask Him for help and guidance and direction. And then we recite any short surah or any selection of the Quran. The Quran is God's word, and when we hear the Quran by reciting it. We are hearing his commands and reminding ourselves with what God wants from us. Then we go in prostration where we bring ourselves down and look straight down and we praise God the Almighty. Praise God the Almighty. Praise God the Almighty. And then, or we say glory to God the Almighty, we rise up and say, God, accept the prayer of those who praise him. So we say, oh God, to you is all the praise. Now it's time to ask God for whatever you want. And the closest a human being can be to God is when you humble yourself. Arrogance is what keeps us away from God. Humble yourself. And we do that physically by going down all the way. And we are proud creatures and we, are, we walk upright and we never like to lower ourselves to anything but to our God, to cre our Creator, we know that when we lower ourselves, we are actually being even raised by Him, glory be to Him. So we go all the way down and I put my forearms and my hands, knees and toes all on the ground in full submission <coughs> to my Creator. And I say, glory be to you, the Most High. Glory be to you, the Most High. Glory be to you, the Most High. And this is the time to ask for whatever you want. Help, direction, guidance. In this prayer, you relax. You take a break from whatever you were doing before and whatever is ahead of you, and you get ready to go back to work, school, family, etc., etc., energized, feeling that God is with you. And if God is with you, then who can be against you? While if God is against you, what does it help whomever it you think is with you. So, prayer is there to help you connect with God throughout the day, from the morning. The very first thing we do in the morning is prayer. Around midday, lunchtime, we offer our second prayer. In the mid-afternoon, when we go from work or school, whatever, we offer our third prayer. And after sunset, in our fourth prayer, and before going to bed is our fifth and last prayer. So throughout the day, you are connected with God. And 
if you do that properly, everything in between will be something to please God and within the guidelines of God. I want to thank you again for coming to share with us what we believe and to learn more about what we believe. And we hope to see you and come visit you also in your synagogues and churches. And I, we will be more than happy to answer your questions in the session to come after the, the next segment. Thank you very much all. God bless you. Shaheen. So just a reminder, all of you, if any of you do have questions, just go ahead and write it on the note cards and just raise your hand. And I, I'll come by and grab them or one of the other volunteers will grab them. Or if you need more note cards, just raise your hand and we'll get you more. The other thing in terms of the announcement is after the entire Q&A is over, we kindly ask you to go ahead and stay just for a few minutes longer. The volunteers will be passing out feedback forms on how I did, as well as the others, primarily me. <laughs> but in terms of we really ask you to go ahead and please fill out that feedback so it'll help us for the next one that we do here. Thank you. So the next part, and the next speaker that I'd like to go ahead and invite is Dr. Sabil Ahmed. He is the currently the director of Game Peace Project, which is an outreach project of ICNA, the Islamic Circle of North America. GamePeace.com conducts many outreach-oriented projects within Chicago, as well as many cities around the nation, to educate people about the teachings of Islam. Some of their projects here in Chicago include advertising the message of Islam on the CTA buses, the CTA trains, billboards on the highways, there's one on 294 near O'Hare, as well as on 355 and 83 area in Lombard, as well as newspapers. Dr. Sabil was born in India, and he actually studied to be a medical doctor. And he did become a medical doctor, so he is a licensed medical physician. But he gave up medicine. For what? To go ahead and teach people and promote the teachings of Islam on a full-time basis. He currently lives in Morton Grove with his family and his children. So one thing our resident scholar, Imam Shaheen, just mentioned in his speech is one of the ways to worship God is to help out your neighbors. So on that basis, I'd like to go ahead and share a story. Some of you may have heard it. Last year during the polar vortex here in Chicago, when it was negative 27 degrees temperature and negative 65 degrees wind chill, most of us, I don't know about you, but for me, sure, didn't leave the house or didn't even think about leaving the house. But what was Dr. Seville worried about? What's going on with his neighbors? How are they doing? So what did he do? He didn't actually have their cell phone numbers or their home phone numbers. So he did what he knew, took out a piece of paper and wrote a simple message that said something along the lines of, my name is Sabil Ahmed and I'm your neighbor and I'm here to help you during this polar vortex to pick up your groceries, help you clean your snow or whatever else that you may need. If you need a cup of hot tea or samosas, which you just ate outside, come to my house. This is my cell phone number. This is my address. He, his wife, and two kids printed out about 40 to 50 pieces of paper with this message, went around Morton Grove and just stuck in people's houses, knock on their doors, and just put it on their doors, between their doors. He didn't think anyone was gonna respond to his call thinking most people, I would have thought he was crazy, right? Going out at negative 27 degrees. But this guy did it. He's coming up next to speak with you. And lo and behold, about six to seven people actually responded, saying, hey, I need some help. Not only from Morton Grove, but somehow that letter got to Park Ridge. <laughs> Don't know how it happened. But there actually, a lady from Park Ridge called and said, hey, I don't live in Morton Grove, but I need some help, can you come and help me? And by God, this guy went there. I tell my kids, don't talk to strangers. <laughs> but this guy went to their house and helped her. 
took, actually in the news, they said he took spinach and yogurt and helped her, and she was very grateful. So that's one way of worshiping God. And that particular story was picked up by ABC and WGN. So you might have seen it. If you haven't, you heard it now from me. So I invite Dr. Seville to come up and speak with you about the Muslims in America and the world. Dr. Seville. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I start in the name of God, the most beneficent and the most merciful, and welcome and greet all of you with the Islamic reading of Assalamu Alaikum, which means may God's peace and blessings be upon each single one of you. You know, when I look at all of you, there is one person who has listened to my presentation so many times, and her name is Linda. And uh, next time I'm thinking, you know, in case if I'm not able to make my presentation, I may call her to come up, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I speak there, you know, in the end. <laughs> now, it's really important, as Imam Shaheen has mentioned, and the praise has mentioned, you guys could have been anywhere. It's nice weather. You know, winter is coming soon, brother. <laughs> so that's better enjoy. But God brought you over here, so we as brothers and sisters, all of us together, we learn from each other. So it so happened that yesterday I was going and driving to the airport, to the Midway airport, to drop off one of my family members. The, two, the 1994, the Diane Ryan, as you know, Friday night rush hour, it was jam-packed. And my daughter, she was asking, why is it called rush hour if everyone is not going anywhere? <laughs> I, don't, I, what's the, I don't know the answer. So what happened was, I showed them and I took this photo. I mean, not me driving photo, by the way. My wife was next to me. So she took this photo and I asked them this question to my children. You know, what do you think these two buildings are? This one and this one. What do you think? What are those buildings, by the way? Yes, tower. Yes, tower. Yes, tower. Yes, tower. John and Cock building. Okay, so now is, here is my quiz question to all of you, right? You know, food has been so long ago, maybe extra samosas for all of you. I'm not sure. What do those two buildings have in common? There are three things that they have in common. Kevin? They both have a channel. Oh, come on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now they have four things in common. <laughs> They were black, yeah, they, they were tall. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so what three important things that they have in common? It's not, it's not a trick question. <laughs> they identify the this skyline of Chicago. <laughs> yes, sir. They use a uh, tube construction concept for high rise buildings. All right, you're going somewhere. What's your name? I'm an architect. <laughs> there you go. Okay. What better person to say? Okay, who was the main architect of those buildings? There's one thing that they have in common. Yes, sir. Can you spend the room? No. I'm not an architect. <laughs> yes, sir. Fazl or Khan. Yeah, Dr. Fazlul Khan, a Muslim from Bangladesh. Yeah. In 1973, he constructed or he was the main architect of those buildings. Now the second thing they both have in common is that they are the first and the second tallest buildings in Chicago. But the third most important thing, Imam Shaheen, that they have in common is this. What do you think this building is right here? Trump Tower. <laughs> Trump Tower, right? So the third important thing they have in common is that both of them, made by a Muslim, are taller than the Trump Towers. Yay! <laughs> Was that a trick question, Diane? <laughs> Alright, so, my presentation today is what are some of the contributions the Muslims have done in the US and in the world. Now, how many of you are science teachers or history teachers or any teacher in high school? None of you? Surprise, what do you do? <laughs> when I went to school here in Schaumburg, I was taught that um, 
you know, the Greeks and the Romans, they contributed a lot. But then there was a fall of the Roman Empire, and from that time, 2,000 years, until the Renaissance, they were the Dark Ages. <laughs> right? Is that not? That's what they teach. But God willing, inshallah, as we say, I want to share with you, we want to share with you that what happened in those, you know, quote-unquote, Dark Ages. What were the Muslims doing? But before I mention that, let's go over the history of uh, Muslims in the USA. So that is the person, by the way. So that is the person. His name is Dr. Fazlur Rahman, who constructed the Willis Tower and the John Hancock. And there are many other buildings, by the way, that he also made uh, in Houston and different places. So now the second question to all of you. What do you think, when do you think the Muslims started to come to the USA? Right? So, Imam Shahid, make sure nobody is uh, Googling now, right? <laughs> make sure, man, come on, everyone has smartphones here. D. D? Who said D? Ma'am, is that your final answer? <laughs> the answer is E. 1529, according to New York Times, Esteban Manico, he was the very first Muslim who set foot in the USA. But some historians, they say that there have been many, many other Muslims who came before Columbus and along with Columbus. Yeah. But at least we have documentation that Muslims are living here in this country for literally centuries. So Muslims were here before the grandparents of the president came here. <laughs> what do you think all of these wars have in common? It's not a trick question, but <laughs> yes. What's your name? Yeah, go ahead. They must have had Muslim uh, soldiers. Yeah, every single war that you see up there, Muslims were part of those wars in the side of America. Yes. In the side of America. Very important. Because Bampit Muhammad, he took part in the Revolutionary War uh, along with many, many Muslims. Along with George Washington, yes. So Muslims are part and parcel of the USA from the very beginning, even before the founding of United States of America. Now the third or fourth quiz question is this one. What do you think Kevin, they have, or Jim? Kevin is done. No, Jim. Right? <laughs> what do they have in common? These three individuals. Who are these, by the way? I mean, do you recognize any one of them? No. Just I like, took some Google clips, Diane. <laughs> That's what I did. Yeah. Now these three individuals. The very first one is Sultan Muhammad uh, the Third of Morocco. And the Muslims, you may you should know this, by the way. I would be disappointed if you don't, <laughs> right? Uh, the second one is uh, Johannes de Graffe, governor in Netherlands. And the third one is Tipu, Tipu Sultan. He was uh, one of the prominent leaders in India. So, okay, fine, Muslims, go for it. What do they have in common? It has to do with 1776, the brace. I'm giving you all the hints, man. Come on. <laughs> By the way, give him a good feedback. He was good, right? Give him a big hand, yeah. Good job. So, okay, anyone? Maybe. Nice, do you ask? There you go. Give me a big hand. He got it. I was not expecting that from anyone. Very good. He's from Morocco. He's from Morocco, right? There you go. So Morocco became the very first country in the whole world that recognized and gave the support to the young United States of America, a Muslim country. And obviously, Netherlands became the second country. And there was a country within the country of India. Mysore, that became the second, the third country. So out of the top three countries in the whole world, two of them, they recognized USA initially, when before France and Germany and Spain, it were the Muslims. So the point I'm trying to make is, Islam and Muslims are part of United States of America, literally for centuries. We are not immigrants, we are not foreigners, we belong here, this is our country, is it not? Yes. Yeah? yes. Come on, as much as for the Alexander Webb, He's a, he was a convert to Islam, and the president of that time, he appointed uh, Alexander Webb to be uh, as an ambassador to the Philippines. Tipu Siddiqui, doctor from, uh, from Northwestern. 
Mm. Wonderful discoveries, many patterns by the way. And he is a Muslim. The reason I'm saying is, many a times the media, when they have to depict Muslims and Islam, they almost always they show negative images. Mm -hmm. They have certain narrative that they have in mind. And they don't highlight those Muslims, those pioneers, those movers and shakers and the peacemakers. So it is our duty as Muslims and as you as brothers and sisters, we need to know it, we need to appreciate it. That's how we can do the fear of the unknown. Right, Tinder? There are no less than 50,000 doctors in the USA who are from the Muslim background. You know, when the earthquake of Haiti happened, 10,000 uh, patients were treated by the Muslims. Doctors and physicians and nurses, they went up there. You know, even when that hurricane is coming, may Allah protect me, God protect all of us. Even as the hurricane is coming, it may, you know, cause whatever damage. They are right now from all over the USA, Ikna Relief. And many mosques, and many Muslims, many doctors, many physicians, they're all getting ready to go there. In case if there is any damage, we want to be the first people on the ground. And that's what Islam teaches. You know, that brings me to a saying of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Muhammad, peace be upon him. He mentioned that you are not a full believer if you eat your food, if your neighbors are hungry. That means taking care of the neighbors. The neighbor, as Imam Shaheen has mentioned, they're not just the immediate neighbors. Neighbors is, in fact, all of humanity. So anytime any person is needing help, it is not just the Muslims that we want to cater, because according to the Quran, every single human is our brother and sister. Nobel Prize uh, winner, right? father of uh, femtochemistry, um, the most points in the NBA, 36,000, yeah, you can clap, all right. We have an NBA fan over here, very good. By the way, who's your favorite NBA player now, Sandra? I'm not a uh, basketball fan except the University of Iowa. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Why not? No, nothing in Chicago? No. <laughs> no. He's still number one after all these years, I believe, in all the records. I don't know what it is. Be yes, yes. Score or Most number of points so far. All right, then you have. Uh, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> okay, who is this person? Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali. And Muhammad Ali, this is what he said. I am a Muslim and there is nothing Islamic about killing innocent people in Paris, San Bernardino and anywhere else in the world. True Muslims know that the ruthless violence of so-called Islamic jihadists goes against the very canons of Islam. It's a really important statement he mentioned. And the reason is that there are good and bad apples in the followers of any faith. So I as a Muslim, I always say to my Muslim friends, to my family, to my children, Let's not blame our Christian brothers and sisters and Christianity and the Bible for what that uh, person has did in New Zealand in the name of Christianity or what Andre Brevik has done in uh, Norway. 78 million people were, not million, 78 people were you know, butchered by him. The Crusades, the Inquisition, what I said is that there are good and bad apples. Blame those people and not Christianity. Blame those Muslims and not Islam. It's a really important lesson we need to take from this important segment. So this brother, by the way, what he did was, when the government was shut down, he went around and he collected 22,000 plus and to help those people who are affected. Some people who are single parent households, people who may be disabled. So he collected that money and he sent out. And who is this? Um, Dr. Mahershala Ali. <laughs> yeah, there you go, right? Somebody's awake. <laughs> Wonderful. So again, he's a Muslim. He's a Golden Globe in 2019 and a House of Cards. Time Magazine actually named him as the 100 most influential person, one of the most, uh, 100 most. I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say is Muslim is not just a scholar or a speaker or a person who prays five times. Muslims are there in all walks of life. There you go. You get a second chance again. Who is this person? All right, you got it, man. <laughs> yeah, he's a Muslim, by the way. Why not? Muslims can be good players. <laughs> Why are you surprised? <laughs> yeah, Shaq is a Muslim. <laughs> Let's repeat that. Yeah, so Shaq, uh, he became a Muslim like many times ago, many years ago. Uh, who is this person? Oz. Oz. 
right? So his background is Turkish, and uh, yeah, I mean he has a really famous uh, show, and uh, and uh, yeah, he happens to be a Muslim. Who is this? We should know this man. Come on. You saw Akim Olajuwon. Yes, he won two championship, and uh, yeah. I mean, so what I'm saying is that there is a saying in Islam. There is a saying that Muhammad, peace, so he mentioned that Allah loves those deeds when a person does it and does it really good. So that moves me, him, Muslims, and especially those people that you see. We have to do good things, but we should do them to their perfection, to the best of the ability. Dave Chappelle, mm. are you surprised? So he's a comedian, right? And obviously he um, he was in many, many different uh, shows and movies. Uh, Nobel Prize winners. One of the first people who went there to rescue the people after 911 was none other than a Muslim. So we are also the first re responders, just like anyone else. Iftihaj Muhammad, anyone? Yeah, you guys heard her name, saw her. She won, I think, the bronze medal in 2016 Olympics, world champion in way back 2014. And the reason she wears the hijab, obviously, there's a, you know, you can ask that question later on to the sister panelist. I mean, that's one of the tenets. So wearing the hijab and modesty and following the principles of Islam, a Muslim can be empowered to be the world champion. That's the message she wants to convey. Uh, Jamal. You know, there are no less than 15,000 Muslims in the U.S. Army, by the way. He was one of the founders of YouTube. We all are so much used to, you know, there are 7 billion, not million, by the way, Imam Shahi, billion videos on YouTube. And the very first video that was uploaded was none other than him. So he went to the zoo with his family, all right? He took the video and he uploaded the video and that became the most, the, the first video on the YouTube. So what happened one day, and I'm going to wrap up uh, soon, is that uh, I was giving a presentation at UIC. It was something similar topic. After the presentation on Islam and the Muslim contributions, one of the non-Muslim youth, he raised the hand and he asked the question, you know, fine, you know, those were all the inventions, the discoveries the Muslims did in the past. Uh, how are they affecting us now? Those inventions, what are the Muslims doing now? So then I gave that uh, brother a quotation from Khalifa Arena, and she said, way back in 2011, that and this Muslim civilization was driven more than anything by invention. Its architects designed the buildings that defied gravity, and its mathematicians created algebra and algorithms that would enable the building of computers and the creation of encryption. So I told that brother, the young brother, is that you know the smartphone that you have, the computer, the projector that we have, uh, the ring device that we have at home, all of them, none of them could be possible if not for the Muslims who laid the foundation for all of these. So our civilization, the 21st century civilization that we uh, take for granted, they were built on the shoulders of the Muslim giants who were moved by the precepts of the Quran. So really briefly, the dark ages, right? So these are not the dark ages from Minecraft. Okay. It's like nobody plays Minecraft nowadays. <laughs> no laugh, come on, man. Stop this. Don't you play Minecraft? You do? Yeah? He's the only one laughing there. <laughs> so those were the quote unquote the dark ages for the Europeans and maybe some other nations and some other you know places. But for the Muslims, those were the golden ages. Because in those times, that's when Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was given the revelation. And the main, the very first word of the revelation that God gave to Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the word, read. Yeah. Right, Imam Shaheen? The Quran. Read. Means gain knowledge. Go around. Explore the world. Gain good knowledge so you can recognize the majesty of God. Using that knowledge, you can better humanity. So the very first word in the Quran that God revealed to Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a guidance to all of us, was none other than the word read, knowledge. So taking that as the inspiration, here are some of the wonderful ways that Muslims have contributed in history. Then I will quickly wrap up. You know, what you see up there, these are surgical instruments. Any surgeon here, by the way? 
Okay, so you're familiar with that, right? So even in 21st century, the instruments that we use, most of them, they were invented by this Muslim, this Muslim surgeon, mm. right? Zerubi, way back in Spain, thousand years ago. So if people ask, you know, what have Muslims done? No hospital, no theater would be complete if not for the invention of this Muslim surgeon. Really important. What about pediatrics? Oh, good picture, right? <laughs> what about pediatrics? You know, Al Razi, a physician in the seventh, in the ninth century, is called as the father of pediatrics because of the humongous contributions that he have done in that field. By the way, my wife sitting up there, who also went around with me in the cold weather, she's there. It's not just me, by the way, the brace. The whole family took part in there, right? There we go. So she's a pediatrician from Pakistan, right? and she's familiar with this. That all the thousands and millions of pediatricians who came, this person, this Muslim, this pediatrician is called as the father of pediatrics for the humongous contribution that he has done. And uh, medicine, you know, Ibn Sina, he wrote a book called The Canon of Medicine. And that book was a classical book of medicine for five centuries all over the world, especially in Europe. Yes, ma'am. He was also one, because I've done some research on, uh, on the origins of modern hypnosis and altered states of consciousness, he was also had uh, in his books explored the early precepts that we have in modern psychology as well as states of consciousness and mental illness when in Europe they were still burning and stoning people who were mentally ill. There you go. <laughs> I'm serious about this. So many contributions. Wow. Thanks a lot. Oh, I admire him so much. <laughs> No, <laughs> not, on the, not on this topic, perhaps another day. <laughs> it's not just called as the father of medicine, it's also called the father of pharmacology. That's an addition, by the way, right? So what I'm trying to say is 500 years, not like, you know, one generation, two generation, 500 years, classical book, all over the, all over, you know, Oxford, different places. And, uh, you know, just whole lecture can be done on this. Uh, the, the very first true hospitals the world has ever seen, they were started to be built in the 11th century in Baghdad and Cairo and Spain and Syria, different places. But they have their own units, the su surgical unit, the pediatric unit, psychiatry, psychiatry and medicine, internal medicine, all of those units, the way that we take it for granted. But Muslims were the pioneers of the hospitals that we see in the 21st century. How about the pharmacies, by the way? 754, the very first true pharmacy was built in Baghdad by the Muslims. Yes. And that's according to a pharmacological journal. Now those who become doctors, physicians and start practicing, we have to, we have to do some residency. And the residency program was started by none other than the Muslims. Right? That's also a contribution. And we take it for granted. Any chemistry majors here? Oh my, good, yeah, very good, at least one, right? What do you all do, the rest of you? <laughs> Paralegal. <laughs> there you go. So when we go to the chemistry lab, right? When we go to the chemistry lab, many of the instruments that we work on, the flask, the test tube, and the rest of the instruments, lo and behold, many of them, they were, they were invented by a, by a Muslim chemist by the name of Jabir bin Hayyam. Look at this. He discovered many assays and, uh, you know, he 25 plus instruments that we take it for granted. Our kids, our youth, colleges and high schools that they use. Sociology, the same thing. Uh, physics, any physicist here? No, Kevin, come on. What do you do? <laughs> I work for a pharmaceutical company, but not in chemistry. Not in chemistry, okay. <laughs> All right, so chemist, you know, physics is really important, by the way. Uh, Ibn al Haytham, you know, according to New York Times in 1999, they took a survey. Listen to this, really neat. They took a survey to find out who was the most influential scientist of the 1,000 years. You know, that includes Newton, Einstein, Galileo, uh, many, many of them, right? Influential people. And when they took the survey, lo and behold, what people have agreed upon is that the most influential scientist in the last 1,000 years is none other than this Muslim scholar. 
Yes. So that's one of the. So what do you think he did, by the way? The, hopefully the answer the answer is there. Okay. The scientific he perfected the scientific method. Yeah. Scientific without the scientific method, we cannot have any research done. By the way. So his perfection led to the many inventions and the discoveries. Uh, math majors, mathematicians, come on, you. Don't be shy, do not pick on you. <laughs> Who, whose favorite is algebra and, math, uh, and uh, algorithms? <laughs> Come on. No. Uh, yours? All right, very good. So who do you think perfected algebra? That's not you. Yeah, I know it's from an Arabic word. <laughs> it's an Arabic word. Don't know the person's name, though. There you go, none other than al is me. Right? Yes. And algebra, as Kali Fayolina, she has mentioned, that our computers, our encryption is based upon what the mathematicians have done. So yes, that is one of the most influential. You know, when we use our smartphones to dial our friends and uh, you know, our family members, what do you think those numbers are? These are not uh, Roman, they're not Roman, you know, they're not Latin, Spanish, er, Sandra, there you go, they're Arabic, right? Because that's where those numbers are coming from. Oh, we don't have this. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the reason I have that photo, and this is the last slide, is that yeah. who is that, Sandra? Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. You like his movies? Not so much. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Being growing up in India, I used to watch many, many movies, Hollywood movies. And my only perception of all of you is that you look like him. Yeah. <laughs> and like him. <laughs> Not knowing better, that was how the media was polluting me. So the message to me and to all of you and to the rest of humanity is that we should not believe 100% in the media. If you want to know what Christianity is teaching, go to a church. If you want to know what Judaism is, go to a rabbi, go to a synagogue. And if you want to know what Islam teaches, don't go to Fox News or Fake News or the White House. Go to the Muslims. Right? Go to the Muslims. So I have one minute to go. Let me wrap up with this important statement, Sandra, from the Quran. This is a translation. It says in the Quran, chapter 49, verse number 13. And since all of you are going to get, get, get a gift of the Quran, by the way, today, you can look this up. Chapter 49, verse number 13. And it says in there, the translation, God is speaking to all of humanity and God is saying, that, O mankind, O humanity, I have created you from one single male and one single female. And made you into nations and peoples and tribes, that you get to know each other. Not that you may hate and bias and discriminate with each other, you get to know each other. And then God says that the best amongst you is the one who is a well-mannered person. So I hope and pray that all of us together, as brothers and sisters in humanity, that we work together with God's guidance and we can, inshallah, God will establish societies which are based upon justice, which are based upon equality which are based upon morality and peace for all. And once we do that, inshallah, God willing, not only we can make America great again, we can make the whole humanity great again. And may God help us all. Yes. Thank you. Let me move that photo away. <laughs> I'm Shaheen, and then we also have one of our sisters, as a panelist who will be joining us, I'm going to go ahead and give her a quick introduction. Sister Fariha Shakib. She is currently serving as the National Director of Dawa, which is outreach for the Sisters Wing of ICNA, the Islamic Circle of North America. She is also the former president, the national president of ICNA, to the ICNA Sisters. She is currently very active volunteer and teaches Islam to newly converts and children. So I ask Sister Fariha, Imam Shaheen, and Dr. Sabil to come on up to the stage and we'll go ahead and start our Q&A. So the format will be, I'll go ahead and start reading the questions. I'll have either one of the panelists answer it 
if there's a particular panelist that wants to take it on more than the other, or if there's a question for the sister, she will go ahead and answer, and then we'll go from there. Before we start, Sister Frieha will go ahead and give her a quick introduction and like to say a few words. So we're gonna go ahead and give Sister Frieha the mic. Hello to everybody one more time. Uh, welcome to this mosque and thank you for spending your day today here. So my name is Freya, as I've been already introduced. Um, before any introduction, I think that when I'm here to answer the question, if I'll be able to, but I know one question which arises in everyone's mind as soon as they look at me. <laughs> my unique attire, um, uh, it's so funny that once I was going, um, I was at Walmart, there was a small child, a small boy, and then um, he looked at me, it wasn't the Halloween season, he looked at me, he pointed at me, and he said, Mommy, look, she's wearing a costume. <laughs> but then he said, it's not even Halloween, why is she wearing a costume? And I was laughing. Um, but I really appreciate it, and I really like it. Anyone, you know, comes up to me, a few of my friends here this morning, this afternoon, they came up to me, they asked me, and I always appreciate it. People ask me, why do you cover your face? Because um, you see most of the Muslim women covering their head with the headscarf, not everyone is covering the face. So I just thought, you know, and already knew that this question would come up, so <laughs> I thought to clarify it that I don't have any sickness right now, <laughs> I don't have any contagious, I'm not a ninja, just as an extra piece of brownie, or I would say as an extra credit. I use this opportunity to do something extra which is not mandatory or compulsory for all Muslim women. And actually, my inspiration comes from the wives of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who used to cover their faces. Just a form of modesty, something extra, which I'm doing as my own choice. So I just wanted to say that. And I think I'm already introduced, so there's no need for more introduction. Um, I'm a mother of five kids, so yeah, that's my <laughs> that's the introduction which I love the most. My eldest one just started college. Um, my youngest one is a seventh grader. So yes, thank you. So we have three mics. I'll go ahead and read off the questions in no particular order. And again, if you have a question and someone's at the podium, then we'll go ahead and just alternate. Again, for the speakers on the panel, I'll let any one of you go ahead and take it. The first question, why is a dog considered unclean? Is the creation narrative the same as the Jewish and Christian tradition? <laughs> I'll take all the easy ones, I'll give all the hard ones to <laughs> Well, the dog is a very friendly animal. And the dog is the most sincere animal. To, uh, but God the Creator knows what is, to what extent we should uh, 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 deal with others regardless, dogs, pigs, horses, etc, etc. So in Islam, uh, we are, we have the status of purity, meaning uh, how we come to prayer. And when we come to prayer, we need to come with clothes that are pure from any impurities. So this is why Muslims always wash after anything that makes their hands dirty or using the washroom, etc. So that same direction that Almighty God who created us and created dogs told us to purify ourselves from the saliva and the sweat of dogs. There is something in it. I don't know. I'm not an expert on this. And this is not usually an important question usually for us. I mean, with all respect to, but I, I honestly, this is the first time in, uh, I, I get this question in my memory. But uh, it, it's, it's interesting. Everyone gets something uh, 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 that interests, or, or maybe they, they noticed something. But for us, yes, we use dogs to, to, uh, for the shepherd and farms and for help around the farming and uh, uh, in a lot of different ways, dogs def definitely very friendly and useful in our life. 
but uh, we do avoid the saliva and the sweat of, of dogs if they are around us or if, if somebody works with dogs like in, 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 in a police station or something where, uh, but in, uh, we do avoid uh, the saliva and they are used or they are considered impure, but n nothing to offend dogs here. Okay. <laughs> you know that uh, Imam, that, uh, that makes me remember a story from the Islamic history. So one of the main tenets of Islam is that uh, not only we have responsibility to the Creator, we have responsibility to the humans, we have responsibility towards animals, and we have responsibility towards the whole creation by the way. So loving all the animals, taking care of all the animals is also part of Islam. So I'm reminded of a story in which a, a lady who is considered in Islam, that lady, right? She committed some sins. But one time as she was walking in the desert, she became really thirsty. And she came across a well, some water, which was like really deep. As she was about to drink the water, in came a dog and he was really thirsty. So what she did was, she placed a small bucket in the well and she took off the water and she gave the water to the dog and according to the Islamic sources, God forgave her the sins because she took care of that animal, of that dog. So yes, just as a generality, Muslims are supposed to take care of the animals, take care of the creation, take care of the environment and obviously take care of the humans. So then there is one question about uh, the narration of uh, the creation story, is it similar compared to Islam and uh, Judaism, right? Correct. Okay, fine. So when you look into the Old Testament and when you look into the Quran, there are many, many similarities, but there are certain differences. So one similarity is that both Islam and, and, and the Old Testament, we believe in the creation story. We don't believe that uh, humans were evolved from the apes. We don't. We say that Adam and Eve, they were the very first creation for the humans by the Creator. But here is a slight difference between the Islamic and the Quranic story. So after the creation of Adam and Eve, when they were sent on earth, after they committed the sin, after they were sent on earth, God mentions that it was both Adam and Eve who equally took part in the very first sin. Unlike Judaism, or unlike the Bible, in which uh, who was the very first person who committed the original sin? Yeah. Yeah, right? But in Islam, they were both equally responsible. So what I say, and what she may also say, is that equality in Islam starts from day one. Yeah. <laughs> the second difference is that in the creation story of the heavens and the earth, Islam does not give the date of 6,000 years for the creation of the heavens. It does not. Islam says that many, many eons ago, an eon can be like millions of years. And number third is that both Adam and Eve, they repented to God, according to the Quran. And God forgave their sins. So the third difference is that we don't believe in the original sin aspect, what the Bible says. We say that every child is born pure, innocent, without any blemish. After they reach the age of puberty, if and when they commit the sin, that's when they are responsible. Even then they can directly approach God and ask for God's forgiveness. So as you can see, there are some similarities, but then there are also some differences. Thank you. Kind of following up on that question about equality, the next question is, if men and women are equal, why the segregation of women in services and activities? Notice today, Pro notice today's program did not include a woman. It would help with the concept of equality. Luckily, we have a sister on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> I know the hard one. <laughs> but then, um, I would say that if it was not the segregation concept, I mean, just imagine if I'm sitting like this the whole day, if, because there's a mixed gathering, or there's a gathering of you know, men and women together, um, so it's for the ease of women, I would say. I take it as a plus point for myself that I have to, you know, we have our own setting, I have kids with me, sometimes I want to, you know, sit relax. Uh, so especially for the prayer um, settings, I, I take it as something which God has given 
as the ease part for for women to to sit and relax and to concentrate on the prayer aspect and to worship God and to you know uh, focus on their um, meditation and the connection with God. Um, that that's the personally you know the, the way which I feel, but Dr. Sandhu might be able to answer it. <laughs> So already good answer. Let me just add one more thing, inshallah, and that would be that uh, the segregation during the prayer was not invented by Islam. If you go to a Jewish synagogue, Orthodox Jewish synagogue, there is segregation. If you go to an Orthodox Greek church, there is segregation, especially in the prayer. As you may have seen, I mean, we have not prayed in front of you, just the Imam prayed. But those of you who have seen Muslims pray, maybe on the TV, maybe social media, we pray literally sh touching shoulder to shoulder. So it may not be as appropriate. I mean, I will not feel comfortable if my wife, my daughter is touching shoulder to shoulder with an unknown man. They would not be comfortable, I would not be comfortable. So this question is now for the brace. Suppose the brace you are praying. And next to you is standing a really you know, beautiful lady. Nice perfume. Standing next to you, where would your mind be? Would it be... Uh, to her or to God? Sorry, man. <laughs> In early Protestant churches, there were separate entrances for men and women. There you go. Right. So, you know, in, in, a, in a place of worship, the purity of heart and mind has to be there. And segregation does not mean that somebody is superior, somebody is inferior. Both are equal in Islam. Both the prayers of men and women are accepted, by the way. Segregation is for the purity of the heart and mind. And that is the greater and the highest purpose for the segregation. And if I may just clarify something, we, we had a sister uh, speaker within the program, and unfortunately, just yesterday night, she called in apologizing for a specific family urgency, and we had to struggle to uh, rearrange the program and uh, 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 reprint it actually uh, without her. Uh, but uh, she, the, we had a sister, and we believe there is no way we can do justice to the program and subject without uh, uh, proper representation. One, one quick thing, if I can just add. So in my case, I mean, when we are talking already about equality. So um, when I got married, I was just 19 years old. And then my studies, I did back home, um, my bachelor's in arts. I got discontinued when I came here. I got married, I had kids. So I mean, um, I always wanted to stay home, and you know, I thought that you know, my studies are done. I did my bachelor's. I said I have to stay home and be a caretaker of my kids. But then it was my husband. He's here today. Well, actually, he's sitting. In the back. It was my husband who pushed me, and he's still pushing me that no, you have to go to the college and continue your education. So it's vice versa. I want to stay home. <laughs> my husband is pushing me that no, go to college and continue your studies. If you want to be there, just be there. I'll take care of the kids. So right now my class is in the evening hours, 6 to 9 p.m. every Tuesday night. And he's the one who's taking care of them. So, I mean, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, it's, it's only, I think it's only the misconception sometimes, which we think that, you know, that somebody is subjugated in front of someone or someone is just oppressed. Actually, that's not the case. Thank you. Just for a point of clarification, I'll give myself two hoots. My wife did her master's after we got married, and I had, we had her first. So I kind of took care of my eldest as well during that time frame. Right? <laughs> Next question. Why is the Quran saying rather than spoke? Maybe Sheikh Shaini can answer that. Well, the Quran being the last testament of God, God wanted it to be preserved and it's preserved in both spoken way and, and, and the word Quran means read or recited as well as in writing but before it was written it was said again transmitted by angel Jibreel from God to or from the uh, uh, preserved tablet of God to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And uh, the, the Prophet being uh, raised and brought among Arabs in the deserts of Arabia, uh, 
people with clear mind and the ability to memorize, there was a, a big group of people who memorized the, the book by heart, even if they were illiterate. I mean, it's puzzling to think of somebody who does not know even how to read or write and be able to memorize a whole book, letter by letter. I mean, from cover to cover, we're talking not misspelling a word or missing an, uh, even a vowel, but they memorize the Quran. And that has become a tradition where a hafiz, a person who memorized the Quran, will teach it to another hafiz and so forth. So today, I believe there's tens of millions of people who memorize the Quran. And some of them are maybe still illiterate. They did not get a chance to go to schools. But they have heard the Quran from their teachers and parents and continue to repeat it till they memorize it. And of course, the majority are literate who read the written text and memorize it. So uh, uh, God addressed us in this book, and uh, it, it is for every human being. So in every language, you will look for translation. But the Quran is only the Arabic text and uh, 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 preserved in, in that form. Why is the Quran saying rather than spoke? Sung. Sung. Yeah. Oh, sung. Is that what you meant? Why is the Quran sung? No, okay. It's a different question. Oh, sung. Let's it's say it. Say. No, go ahead. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm marking you down now. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. The feedback is going to be up, man. It's easy. It's a memorization technique. It's easier to remember that way. Yeah. So according to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when we, are, when we are reciting the Quran, we should beautify our recitation. So it should touch our heart as much as it touches our mind. So when our sheikh and our imam, when he was going over the prayer, and he was reciting the Quran, it may appear as if he was singing, but that is a beautiful recitation. It's a beautiful recitation. So, and then the rest of the answer he mentioned that we say Quran's guidance is not just for the Arabs, the Indian, Pakistani, or the Muslims. We say that the addressees of the Quran is for all of humanity. It's for all of humanity. And for that reason, Muslims of that time, they went to different parts of the world to peacefully convey the message of Islam. And that's how Islam spread peacefully, by people following the guidance looking into their own uh, problems and finding Islamic solutions. So, you know, something special today is our volunteers, by the way, not only they prepared the food, not only they prepared you know, all the displays, they also prepared the gift bags for all of you. In the gift bag, you will find a translation of the Quran. The actual Quran is in Arabic language. But you will get a translation of the Quran and you can still find out the main message of the Quran which is the message of the absolute oneness of God. If I may add also one line to, uh, now that uh, the, the question is clarified more. Uh, the Quran has its own style. In Arabic literature, there is a lot of styles, but there is a style that is the Quranic style, and it's very unique. And the Quran openly challenged all the Arab literature uh, experts in literature to come, and all the poets, to come with something, anything that is comparable to the Quran text. And that challenge continues to be open for the last 1400 years to all the those who got PhDs in Arabic language and the poets to try to imitate the Quran. But no one can. It has this unique uh, 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 rhythm, this unique text that no one can come with something even similar. Even though Arabs in general take pride in language and the sophistication and the beauty of the language. But openly no one and if you read the quran to any arab speaking uh, be uh, an atheist arab or christian or jew uh, any non-muslim 
if you if they hear the Quran, they recognize it. Oh, this is the Quran. It's different from any else, any any other text. So it got this rhythm and this uh, this own style that no one is able to imitate or do any works that in any way sounds similar to. Thank you. So we have about three more questions, two comments. I'll go ahead and take the comments. A prayer of thanks anywhere during prayers. Thank you. Next question. Why do some men wear traditional clothing and others not? Women are dressed in traditional outfits today. It's a choice. It's a choice. It's a land of freedom. You dress the way you are happy with yourself. Uh, I don't know if I'm traditional or mixed both of them together. <laughs> but uh, the, the main issue with dress is the modesty. Our creator tells us to dress modestly. So baggy pants and uh, covering uh, uh, most of our body, uh, but then that the tradition, the style, the colors, that's your choice. So just one comment. I was actually going to wear traditional clothing and my wife refrained me from wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> so by the way, that's one second. So, so so the tradition is so the traditional clothing, so there is no uh, clothing that says, you know, this is the Islamic clothing. There is no specific color. All Islam says is that we should dress modestly, modestly, and modesty and modest dressing modestly is not just uh, for the females; it's also for the males. That means both the brothers and the sisters, means the men and the women. We cannot wear uh, tight clothes. We cannot wear transparent clothes. We cannot wear extravagant extravagant clothes to waste the money. We cannot wear clothes of the opposite gender. So, modesty is for both, by the way. You know, sometimes when people look at the sisters wearing the hijab, they may think men can do and wear any way, but women, they have to be the ones modest. No, modesty goes both ways in Islam. But the concept of modesty does not stop at what we wear. Modesty is a state of mind. Mm. That the Quran says in chapter 24, verse number 30, addressing to the Muslim males, that all males, all Muslim males, Lower your gaze and guard your modesty. That is better for you in the eyes of God. That means we should not stare and lust after people of opposite gender. Then the Quran speaks about the modesty of the years, what we should hear and what we should not hear. So modesty is a state of mind which is applicable for all the humans, may they be males or females. Thank you, Dr. Sylvia. Next question. Do children pray five times a day with their families? Does the father lead the prayer? Do you pray individually or in a group? Okay, so kids do pray five, five times a day. It's not mandatory on them until they reach a certain age, which is like at seven years old, we try to teach, start teaching them and um, making it their habit to offer five times a day. But then as they reach 10 or 11 years old, they are kind of more in a routine and they are taking it more easier. So, um, but then when they hit the puberty, I mean then for, for the adults, for the male adults, it's recommended to come to the mosque, like this place, to offer in congregation five times a day. But definitely if someone is at work, someone is um, studying at college, if they can't make it, then they have to pray individually. Um, so yeah, and women, they are allowed to come whenever they want to come, but they don't have to come to pray in congregation. So it's, again, it's a plus point given to us women while busy, you know, at household chores and doing a lot of stuff, um, so I think. That's good. You know, as you may have seen, uh, we don't have any, um, you know, sculptures, any, ma uh, any symbols over here, because when we Muslims pray, we, we are praying directly to God. We don't go through any mediator. Because one of the attributes of God, names of God, is that God is all-knowing. If God is all-knowing, we don't have to go through any person. May that be dead or alive. So we don't go through Muhammad, peace be upon him, or Jesus, or Abraham, or any saint. We go and approach God directly when we pray, number one. Number two, we don't have any symbols. And number three, some of you may have seen a depiction of the Kaaba. 
Kaaba is the house of worship that Abraham built about 5,000 years ago. So every Muslim when we pray, we pray towards that direction. So suppose if this is Kaaba, every Muslim prays in that direction that also shows the unity of all of humanity all over the world. The next point is that, you know, I have never been to China, by the way. And suppose if I go to China, if I go to a mosque in China, I would feel at home because the Muslims in China pray exactly the same way as the Muslims praying in the rolling meadows. All the prayers are consistent. And lastly on this point, as Imam Shahi has alluded, that every single prophet, every single messenger, may that be Old Testament, New Testament, in the Quran, they all used to pray directly to one God, placing their forehead on the ground. You know, like Abraham, it says in Genesis, uh, chapter 16, verse number 17, verse number 3, when the time for prayer came, Abraham went to a secluded place, he placed the forehead on the ground and he was praying to one God. It's mentioned the same thing about Moses and Joshua in the book of Numbers, chapter 40, in the Old Testament. They did evolution, they went to the place of worship, they put their forehead on the ground, they were praying to God. And Jesus, who we consider as a mighty prophet, you mentioned, right? Matthew chapter 26, verse number 39, when the people were after him, he went to the garden of Gethsemane, over there he prayed, putting his forehead on the ground, that, oh God, take this cup of death away from me, not my will, but your will. So at the end of the day, worshiping one God, following the legacy and the rituals and the message of all the prophets and after we die looking forward to meet the creator and he is going to hold us into account that's one of the tenets so these are the fundamental tenets that all the prophets they pass down to us and they are culminating with the last prophet prophet muhammad peace be upon him so consistency of the prayer is coming from all the prophets and messengers okay. I have about three questions left so let's just be mindful just there were three questions on that one i don't believe i heard the answer for one of them does the father lead the prayer yeah. so suppose if the family is uh, praying at home the father is the one who leads the prayer and the children and the wife and the members they stand stand behind him but as uh, sister fali has mentioned muslims are encouraged to come to the mosque and pray because according to muhammad peace be upon him a Muslim male coming to the mosque and praying, they will get 27 times more the reward. But a sister, she has the option, she can come to the mosque or pray at home, she will get equal reward. But all the men, rain, shine, hay, right, we have to go to the mosque and pray. So yes, at home, if the family is leading, the father leads the prayer. Okay. But if the son is older enough, the son can... Yeah, or the, if the son is old enough, you know, then obviously, yeah, it's a good point, mashallah. He can lead the prayer, yes. Last two questions. Hopefully this is a relatively easy one. What is the percentage of Muslims in India? The percentage of Muslims in India is 13.5%. Uh, close to 14%. But that India, the population is so humongous, right? 1.2 billion people. So that still translates as close to 200 million Muslims in India. So there are more, of all the 57 populous, Muslim populous nations, okay. Indonesia is number one, the second one is India, by the way. Most number of Muslims, the second most number in India, then Pakistan, then in other countries, yes. He's right, I Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> For Google, 14.2% equals 200 million. <laughs> Last question. How does someone join a mosque? Is it based on geography, or can you join whichever one you want? Whatever you want, anywhere in the world, <coughs> any mosque, you can just walk in. No one will ask you for your ID, or membership, or affiliation, or where you live, or uh, what tradition you follow. It doesn't matter. So anywhere you go, you see a mosque, you can just walk in and offer prayer. There is no membership. There is membership just for the support, or if you want to get uh, the news letter of that mosque, or uh, to be on their list, or whatever. But in general, uh, there is no uh, membership or any division based on uh, the geography or uh, where you live.
Two more questions by the same. This is the last card. If you have any cards, just go ahead and raise your hand. I'll have one of the volunteers come and pick it up. If not, we'll conclude with this card. We have two questions left on this card. I think the next one might be best answered by Imam Shaheen, but anyone can take it. How many children do you have in your program at this mosque? Uh, we have the Sunday school, and uh, we have over 150 students in it. Uh, we have uh, different youth and kids programs. Uh, in general, probably the total about 200 plus uh, uh, kids and youth who use the mask program. I got one latecomer coming in. Last one on this card. What are the clocks behind you? <laughs> okay, I can answer that, but I'll let them. <laughs> oh, right there. You can answer that. No, go ahead. Go there is ahead. two clocks, if you see. This is the <coughs> traditional clock or the old style. Well, the main thing, is, of course, the, just the regular clock on the top. But after that, you see five or six of them. Uh, that put the times because we keep track on when do we, when time starts for the next prayer. And if you remember, I told you there is five prayers. So the very first prayer will be uh, 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 and that's a little bit more digital now, uh, it will turn or it will tell you when is the next prayer. Uh, but on the old or tradition way here, it will tell you that the very first morning prayer will be at 5.45, while the noon prayer is at 1.15, the afternoon is at, at uh, 6 o'clock, and the sunset is around uh, 6.30 or so and the last one around 9 p.m. while the main weekly sermon on Friday is at uh, 1.30. So that, uh, just for anyone who walks in the mosque, get reminded on when is the next prayer, because as uh, if you get to learn, those times do differ by uh, uh, as the sunrise move or the sunset uh, change in time between summer and winter. Just to clarify, those timings are the times of congregation. Yes. For example, the morning prayer starts at 5.30, <coughs> so if 5 or 10 people are coming into the mosque, there will be an imam leading. So not only we prefer that a person comes, get 27 more rewards, but the main advantage of being basically a part of congregation, where it's led by imam. And so those are the timings of the congregation, and also the time for people to know if they come after the congregation, for example, 5.30 is a fajr or morning prayer time, and if they missed the congregation, but they still have time, they can still come and pray alone. So this is the time for congregation prayer. Yeah. Yes. So Muslims pray five times, but there are no like, specific time that you have to pray that second or that minute. So there, these are five periods. These are five periods. So the morning one has like one and a half hour before sunrise. And likewise for the rest of the prayers. So those uh, timings, they signify the congregation <coughs> prayer and also the periods between each one of the five prayers needs to be performed. This is the last question. If you have any additional questions, I think all the panelists, I'll be here too. I can answer maybe one or two of them. But feel free to go ahead and stay back afterwards as well as hopefully all of you have received the feedback form card. You've given me five stars. If not, you still have time to What's change it. What's your name it. again? <laughs> <laughs> but please go ahead and fill out the feedback forms and we'll go ahead and collect it afterwards. Last question. I don't know if it's a tough one or an easy one, but I'll let them answer it. What is the position in Islam on LGBTQ individuals? There's more to it, right? LGBTQ. I simplified. <laughs> I wrote it. Well, Islam uh, recognizes the family as a, uh, a bond between a male and a female. And uh, uh, Islam does tell us about. Uh, the gays and lesbian uh, uh, issue as a sin. It is a sin in Islam 
to practice uh, homosexuality. At the same time, uh, that sin, that sin is not a base for people to discriminate against them. I mean, people do sins right and left. And we need to recognize the proper thing in the sight of our Creator and do our best. In the end, people are not to be discriminated or asked about their sexual orientation. We do not interfere in each other's uh, uh, lifestyle. Uh, you might have in, in a mosque a, a, a person who does something wrong to, in, uh, in his neighborhood or, but in the end, we ask people to, to look for the best way in every aspect of life, and we do recognize this as a, a, a sin, uh, as it is uh, uh, categorized in other religions. But we do not go after each other and invasive the uh, privacy of, of others. And I, I wish you brought this, I, I feel guilty. I know some people want to leave, but uh, not to leave it to the last question. That, and over time. I didn't to ask bring, it before To, to bring this, uh, it's okay. Uh, but maybe we can elaborate more uh, on it uh, after time. Unless you want to In ask. conclusion, just hate the sin, not the sin. In the more simple yes. terms. Thank you. Any other questions? We can go ahead and continue to follow up there. If anyone has questions, you're more than welcome to raise your hand. They can do so at this time before we close off for the afternoon. Just one quick thing um, about the question which was asked about who can join which mosque. So I would just say that even um, our fellow Americans, our neighbors, like you all, it's not just for the open house day that you're welcome here. You're welcome any time of the day and any day of the week. And, Whenever you want to step in, whenever you want to observe the prayer, uh, how do we pray and what do we do here, you're more than welcome. So it's, it's open for everybody and anybody. Uh, also, uh, yes. also, also wanted to add one clarification that we are not um, required to be part of only one um, mosque to be members. For example, we are a member of four different mosques. Mm -hmm. So it's not um, membership like um, Sheikh Shaheen explained, it's just uh, to be aware of their um, mailing, mailings and to support them, we become a member, but it is not any one-to-one uh, -one relationship or anything. We can be a member of multiple mosques and any so One, one quick question, and then I will have a comment. The question is, uh, all of you came here today, right? And hopefully you will get your feedback. Just generally, how do you think the whole situation is, right? How was it? this in every mosque and hopefully in every church, every synagogue. Inshallah, God willing. Because that's the way to move forward. There's enough hate out there. We need to make sure that brothers and sisters, all of us, we need to move forward. So as you leave, there would be one or two people who would like to take your testimony, testimonials, your feedback on the video about how you felt. Because we want to encourage, there are 3,000 plus mosques in the US and we want to encourage every single mosque to replicate what we have done here today. So we would really like your feedback and hopefully five stars for him and for all of us. Right? And secondly, secondly, right? As Sister Fari has mentioned that you can come to the mosque any time of the day. It's an open house 24/7, by the way. And uh, just like we had, just like me and my wife invited those people, our neighbors, you are all welcome to come to our house for. Samosas and hearty. <laughs> <laughs> and then she's looking at me, really? All of you? All of you. All of you. What's that address? <laughs> <laughs> you can see it now. <laughs> so again, yeah, I mean, welcome to come to the mosque, by the way, just give us a call and we'll be more than happy. You know, one of our uh, friends over here, Kevin or somebody, your wife was not able to make it, correct? And sure, you can come back with your family. And we'll be more than happy. We'll try to customize a mini open house for you, right? <laughs> Inshallah, God will. Thank you very much, all of you. And I'll do that. Again, in conclusion.